Welcome everybody, um, and today I'm going to talk to you about biofabrication and the role that this plays in the future of regenerative medicine. I work at the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation, which is over at Calvin Grove, and I work together with a, a wide range of researchers there who are working closely to deliver real-world solutions to a range of very important health issues. One of the technologies that we're developing over there is a technology called biofabrication. Now this is an additive manufacturing technique or a 3D printing technique that enables us to create biologically relevant, customized tissue substitutes. So really the vision that we have within our group is to create anatomically precise, customized, patient-specific tissue replacements to treat patients who are suffering large amounts of tissue loss. And I'll talk a bit more about this as I go through my presentation. So I'm gonna jump straight into a clinical case for you here. As you can see, we have an example of a large pelvic tumor where the arrow is pointing here. Um, an MRI image here shows you that you've got this, this tumoric growth, and obviously the, the surgeon is required to excise this from the patient in order for them to survive. And the way that this is treated is usually with a custom-made megaprosthesis. So the surgeon has resected the pelvis, they've removed the tumor and the surrounding bone. Um, this is to ensure that you have a tumor-free margin. So you take out the tumor and you have to ensure that you've taken away all of the surrounding tissue as well to enable, um, to, to prevent any more cancer spreading after the issue. Um, and this is a better patient oncolic, um, oncologic outcome. However, if we look at this example here, we can see that we can use customized 3D printed models and implants moving into the future as an alternative treatment for this kind of condition. So we have a tumor present here in the iliac crest. Um, there's a large amount of bone loss here, and the CT scan can reveal that, that bone loss. So what happens next is we can use a 3D model to create um, a effectively just a, a three-dimensional model that exactly emulates the, the type of tissue that's lost from that patient. And the surgeon is then afforded the possibility to be able to work with this model. It gives them visual perception during surgery, and they really have the ability to be able to see what's wrong with the tissue, and they don't have to go into the patient immediately to, to see this. We can then use modeling to um, look at the resection area, and we can create a 3D printed version of this. The next step is a customization of a scaffold to fit the model virtually and to also create a 3D model of this case. So here we have the actual tumor. This is what it looks like when it's been resected. And here's an example of the actual scaffold that's 3D printed to fit into that tissue in order to, to regenerate and to heal that tissue loss. And here's an example of what the customized 3D printing tissue scaffold looks like. So really, the benefits of 3D printing in this, um, and biofabrication in this kind of context is it's twofold. So you have a 3D printed model that the surgeon can use to enable them to visualize the problem, but you also have a 3D printed customized replacement scaffold to actually regenerate the tissue. Now, one thing to take note of here is our scaffolds are made of resorbable polymers. So in the previous case, you saw there was a large metallic implant that was put into that, that patient. And these can cause quite a lot of problems in the future for that patient should they need to go through an airport metal detector or if they have any more medical imaging scanning. And that metallic implant is very difficult to take out should there be any future complications. In this case, we create a 3D printed scaffold using a resorbable polymer. And this polymer slowly dissolves over time when you implant it back into the patient. And the patient's own tissue can take over the function of that scaffold, can heal the bone, and eventually you're left with no implant whatsoever. So it's a really um, a future-looking um, view to, to enable us to, um, to heal these defect sites. So let's talk a bit about additive manufacturing and how this process enables us to, to work towards biofabricating patient-specific implants. So what is additive manufacturing? Well, it's really an umbrella term, and it groups together lots of technologies that create 3D objects using an additive manufacturing technique. So really a layer-by-layer -layer approach. And there are many different perspectives regarding this kind of technology. Enthusiasts, such as myself, believe this is a great opportunity to revolutionize the manufacturing industries and the markets that they serve. There's also quite a few people who believe there's not been a tremendous impact of this technology other than in a very few sort of successful niches. And also, there's some application concerns when you consider that it's actually possible to 3D print guns. However, on balance, all of these views have some, have some merit. Um, and one thing that's definitely for sure, and that's that additive manufacturing, additive manufacturing is a really important technical innovation. It dates back about three decades, but however, the strategic relevance 
is only really sharply rising in the current climate. So it's really exploded into the public consciousness with regard to how important additive manufacturing and biofabrication really can be. So what if we could change lives with this technology? What if it were possible that a child had an accident on the road, they smashed their skull open, and we could take them into hospital, and we could 3D print them a replacement skull? What if older patients who were suffering degenerative osteoarthritic conditions could be treated with 3D printed cartilage substitutes in order to heal that defective tissue to improve their quality of life? And what if we could save lives, for example, with organ printing? Um, I just want to ask you a quick question, which is when you, when you think about biofabrication, when you think about 3D printing, how many of you envisage this kind of scenario here? <laughs> I take it a few of you. Okay, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about how realistic this is. Um, is this realistic? It's really not particularly realistic. And this kind of image is a little bit frustrating for, for some of us tissue engineers out there who believe that it's sort of leading the, the public to believe that one day we're going to be able to print on the spot a heart, a liver, some lungs. And really, we're moving towards great technological advancements in this area. But being able to print a biologically functional tissue on the spot is possibly never, ever going to happen. However, what we can do is we can create organ substitutes. So what we can do is we can use additive manufacturing techniques to create a scaffold, a 3D structure, using special biomaterials that emulate the type of tissue that you're trying to form. And we can print cells into that structure. So biologically relevant cells, so bone cells if you're trying to heal bone, cartilage if you're trying to heal cartilage, blood vessel endothelial cells if you want to get a blood vessel supply within that, within that structure. When these cells start to proliferate and they start to lay down new bone matrix or cartilage matrix around themselves, that's when they start to form the new tissue. And that's when they start to develop a three-dimensional, biologically functional um, tissue, which is impossible to actually do on the spot. So on the spot 3D printing of whole organs is um, maybe a slightly misleading view of biofabrication. However, we are moving towards being able to heal quite, quite simple tissues such as bone and cartilage and one day we'll be able to print cells into these structures. We can already do this. We can place them into bioreactors. We can place them back into the patient. And eventually that organ structure, that tissue will be able to regenerate. But it will not be simply an on-the-spot solution. So let's talk about 3D printing for a moment. It's a rapid technique. Here you can see a small toy rocket being printed. You can use almost any material for this kind of approach. And you can do it on almost any scale. So this is a beautiful example of 3D house printing. So these are layer upon layer of concrete blocks that have been used in China to develop very um, cost-efficient housing for the local population. Each one of these houses is able to be printed at approximately $5,000, and they can make up to 10 per day. So it's really 3D printing, additive manufacturing. It's really revolutionizing many different industries. It's also very fashionable. So I, I absolutely love this slide because it just shows you the amazing creativity that you can put into this kind of design process when you're creating these 3D printed structures. So we have dresses, we have shoes, we have accessories, and you can really look at the kind of detail that's afforded with this technique. Here's an example of a 3D printed catwalk dress that's on the catwalks of Paris at the moment. And again, this is a wonderful way to just visualize the, the topography, the detail, the complexity, the colors, the types of materials that are used to create these kind of outfits. And this slide just demonstrates beautifully how you can create it to be anatomically precise to fit the contours of somebody's body. So it's not very difficult to imagine that it's pretty easy to then translate that to making an implantable material that can go onto the inside of the body. So biofabrication, what's our motivation? Why are we even doing this? Well, I'm going to show you a few numbers now. I've been told not to call them statistics. Um, but if we consider um, injured or damaged tissues or organs and large cases of tissue loss, you can see here that millions of people every year suffer from congenital birth defects. So an example of this is cleft palate, where during, um, the, during the development, the child's um, roof of the mouth is not developed properly. And millions of people suffer this kind of um, loss of tissue every year when they're born. Also, many millions of people lose their lives to cancer, and millions of people are affected by this. So obviously, breast mastectomies, where you have to have the breast removed, or potentially osteosarcoma cases like this, where you can see there's a large tumor on the bone and you have to take all of that tumor out, just like the example I showed you earlier on with the pelvis. So these cases lead to enormous amounts of tissue loss. How do we heal that tissue? How do we regenerate that <coughs> tissue? Also, possibly a little bit more common, most of you have probably experienced this, 
um, traumatic accidents. Millions of people lose their lives or are affected by traumatic accidents every single year. Michael Schumacher is a, a good example of this. Um, also sporting injuries where the, the skeleton is shattered, the skin's torn off, and the muscles are damaged beyond repair. How do we heal this? How do we prevent these people suffering? Well, we do this by passionate collaborative research. We develop new techniques and we develop new technologies, and we really try to enable a enable the team to create these custom replacement tissues and organs. And these are tailored to the individual patient. And it, it may sound like science fiction to you, but we really believe that this is a future reality for where this technology is heading. So I want to focus a little bit now on who we are, what the team does, and how we're going to get there. So we have a wide range of scientists working on these problems with a, a huge range of expertise. We have biologists, we have chemists, we have physicists, we have mathematicians, we have computer programmers, we have software designers, engineers and clinicians. And really the spark of our vision that drives us to want to do this research is the ability to blow down those walls between those individual discipline areas. We have to come together collectively, we have to work together to solve these problems, engineering problems, clinical problems. You cannot have a doctor in a hospital working on these problems in isolation. You can't have a physicist number crunching and a biologist who's culturing cells. You have to get together to, to really be able to form multidisciplinary teams to, to really meet these medical challenges. So I just want to talk now about a few biofabrication showcases, specifically here at QUT. So first of all, let's talk about cartilage repair. So osteoarthritis sufferers, for example. So we have, um, here's one I made earlier. Um, Travis Klein, um, Associate Professor Travis Klein, is working on developing bioinks to print cartilage for patients who are suffering from um, osteoarthritis. And I'm just going to present a little bit of his work today. So he's developing different types of hydrogels, which enable you to put cartilage cells into those hydrogels and to print three-dimensional structures. So here's two different types of hydrogels that he's using. A hydrogel is sort of midway between a liquid and a solid. It enables you to get a fluidity when you're printing these materials. You all probably know that cartilage, isn't, it isn't like skin, it isn't like bone. It's got a hydrogel sort of com complexity to it. So we can print these 3D structures, and then we look at the types of proteins that are expressed within those structures when you put cartilage cells into those hydrogels and you print them. And it's very important that you get the right types of molecules expressed Type 2 collagen has been expressed quite strongly in these hydrogels here. Type 1 collagen would mean that you were forming bone. So we really have to make sure that we're creating the right kind of biological tissue substitutes. Also, mechanics are very important. So you can imagine that your articulating cartilage surfaces undergo a lot of pressure. So it's very important that when we're developing our new hydrogels and biomaterials, that we get the correct compressive modulus, for example. So we need to make sure that the biomaterials that we're developing, that we're printing, are the same as the native tissue, or as close to as we can as we can manage in the laboratory. I now want to talk a little bit about some of the fantastic breast tissue engineering research that's going on here as well. Breast cancer is a major cause of illness for women all over the world, and about 24% of all reported cases lead to the need for surgery. And the most common techniques for this are lumpectomy and mastectomy. So over at IBI, we have um, our chair and regenerative and Professor Dietmar Hutmacher, who's with, here to, with us today in the audience, and he's really developing this fantastic breast tissue engineering concept. So the concept goes like this. Prior to the mastectomy, the patient has a scan of their body. We can then use CAD modeling to be able to recreate the exact size and shape of the breast pre-mastectomy. We can then use 3D printing to create the scaffold, and we can extract cells from the patient, so we can take endothelial cells and fat tissue we can culture this in the scaffold, and we can implant that back into the patient. So this is just a little animation that shows you how this is sort of predicted to work. So initially, you take a scan of the, of the tissue that you're hoping to heal prior to the mastectomy, and you can print this three-dimensional scaffold. This is then implanted back into the patient. And at the same time, during the same procedure, a liposuction procedure can be used to extract from the abdomen fat cells, so this is effectively a waste tissue, and many people might go for liposuction and, and this tissue gets thrown away. It's not a tissue that anybody wants to keep. In actual fact, you, you can use it, you can treat it properly, and you can turn it into the right type of tissue with the right induction. So we can implant this into the scaffold material, and we can look towards regenerating breast tissue. I also want to talk a little bit about some of our more advanced technology at QUT, which is customized bone repair. 
So this is really close to my heart. This is what I've been working on for quite a while. Um, and it's to create skeletal implants where you've had traumatic accidents or perhaps a tumor excision from the pelvis, for example, or maybe during sporting injury. So again, here's some examples of when you might have a really nasty fracture um, and often plates and screws are implanted into the body which are permanent and they're not always the best solution. It can also happen, a traumatic accident, um, just at home. You may fall off a, a step ladder, you may slip over in the garden. These are very, very common injuries. And when you fracture a bone and a large part of that bone is, is, is missing, it's, it's really hard to be able to heal that, that, that injury. So here's just a, an example of what might happen to someone if they've had a suspected head injury, for example. So let's imagine that you've been at home, you're in the, in the, in the shed and you've had a large box fall onto your head and you're not really sure what the problem is. You can't obviously see that you've got this defective tissue site, but you've, you've really got concussion, you've been knocked out. So what usually happens next is we have hosp hospital admission and the patient will undergo medical imaging. How many people have had an MRI scan or a CT scan? This is the first step that usually happens when we're not quite sure what's, what's, what's wrong or what's been damaged. So the patient is in hospital, they're having medical imaging. And this is really a way to be able to recreate the structure of the body, so usually the skeleton, to see what kind of tissue is defective. So in this case, we've got a really large chunk missing from our head. So we can scan that defected tissue area, and we can create a 3D model of that defected tissue, so a 3D model of that injury site. And we can really make it emulate the exact structure of the bone that was present, that is present, based on um, the bone that's already, that's already there in the head and the adjacent tissue, and we can create these 3D maps, these 3D structures. We can feed those into our computer programs and use algorithms to talk to our 3D printing machines. And we can tell our 3D printing machines effectively to build a scaffold that exactly emulates that defect site. So we can make anatomically precise, customized, sterile scaffolds to fit that defect site. So here's an example, it's a schematic illustration, but it shows you basically how this layer by layer approach builds up these implants. This particular case is I'm um, using ultra-thin fiber network. So I should mention some of the technology that we're working on is using melt electro spinning, which effectively each of the strands of the scaffold is around 50 microns. Now that's half the size of your hair. So you may wonder why we're using that kind of structure. Well, the reason we're doing that is because it really emulates the tissue in your body. So it's much closer to what the collagen fibrils in your body look like. It's a much higher surface area for cells to attach to and to start to lay down new bone, new cartilage, new tissue within that matrix. It's also really important here to talk about the types of material that we're using. We're not printing these out of concrete. We're not making um, little orange rockets. We are making biocompatible, FDA-approved scaffolds that are able to be implanted directly into the patient. For example, resorbable sutures. You've probably all had sutures when you've had an operation in hospital. So we can use the same kind of materials to make these scaffolds from. And they're dissolvable. So as I talked to before, it's really important that um, when you're using polymeric implants that we give them a chance to dissolve over time. So we can tailor the chemistry, depending on how serious the injury is, to degrade over a certain period of time. We can make them mechanically strong when you first implant them, and then slowly by hydrolysis, which means the water molecules will break down that polymer network, we can start to degrade these scaffolds over time. I'll, go, I'll talk in a little bit in a minute about how the cells will play a role in that as well. So once we have started to print our 3D scaffolds in our 3D bioprinter and our biofabrication equipment, we can precisely place bioinks into that structure. So this might be cartilage cells, for example. It could be growth factors. These are um, factors that we can apply to different tissues to stimulate either new bone growth, new cartilage growth, new blood vessel growth. And we can actually put those directly into the scaffold, depending on what type of tissue we're trying to heal. We can use different types of growth factors in skin scaffolds. We can use bone morphogenic proteins to heal bone. We can use different types of cartilage cells for healing cartilage. So really the, the material can be selected based upon what kind of, um, what kind of tissue you're trying to, to heal. And also the growth factors in the cells can be selected based upon what kind of tissue you're hoping to heal. So we have this layer by layer process with the bioinks, with the cells, with the growth factors and with that scaffold. So let's have a look inside that scaffold. Let's zoom into that. Again, pay note to the um, scale bar here. It's 50 microns. These strands of these scaffolds are very, very small, and the sizes of the cells are approximately 20 microns. So you can see there's a huge surface area inside this, this scaffold, this three-dimensional scaffold. The cells start to attach to that scaffold. They start to feel that it's similar to their native environment, and they start to proliferate. 
they grow, they multiply, they start to fill all of those pores between their scaffold struts. And as they start to do that, they begin to lay down extracellular matrix. They start to encompass themselves in new bone tissue. And they really start to recreate that bone environment, in this case where we're healing the skull defect, um, that's an anatomical, precise size and shape based on the scaffold of the defective tissue. So prior to that happening, because this takes many, many weeks, the proliferation of the cells, but once we've seeded the cells into the scaffold on the spot, we can implant that back into the patient. And it's a perfect anatomical fit. So I'm just going to talk through a couple of preclinical studies that we've already undertaken um, in the various groups around, around Queensland. Um, so I'm going to talk about 3D printed scaffolds and how we've already used those to heal preclinical bone defects. So this is an example of healing a skull defect in a, a preclinical model. We extracted um, bone marrow cells from the iliac crest. We cultured those for two weeks. We made a 3D printed scaffold, which was quite large. You can see this is quite a large defect here, based on this scale bar. We implanted the scaffold, we implanted the cells into that defect site, just to see how well we could heal that bone. And here's an example of the histology of that kind of um, implantation. So histology is effectively the study of tissue. So when we've implanted these scaffolds, we really want to know if we're forming the right kind of tissue. That's, we want to make sure we're forming bone and we're not forming fibrous tissue or skin within that defect. So we take out the scaffold and we take very thin slices of that tissue, approximately five micron thick, and we apply special dyes that, that bind to specific substances within that structure and tell us whether it's bone or not. In this case, the black area is bone. Excuse me. If we focus in, you can see these circular areas here, and you can see this pattern. Does anybody know what, what that could be? My group's here, so they all know what it is. <laughs> Chris. So the scaffold has a resort, the leak is in the front behind. So when you actually do the consulting behind it, when you dissolve, when you actually do the processing, it'll dissolve away, but you behind that um, formation. So okay. you see it throughout lots of the work that we do. So go back to the and look up the answer. Okay. <laughs> So what Chris was just saying there is um, this sort of symmetrical pattern that you can see here. This is where the scaffold is still present in that defect site. This was implanted for two years to heal the tissue, but we used a very slow resorbing polymer. We used polycaprolactone, and this dissolves over many, many years. So you can effectively see that it's still in place. You can see that the scaffold has started dissolving slowly, and the reason we can see that is because you've got this area here around the struts which is actively mineralizing bone. It's osteoid. It's got huge amounts of osteoblasts present there, and they're slowly mineralizing, and they're filling those pores, but the scaffold's still there. It's slowly dissolving. They're mineralizing some more, and it's really starting to, to fill that entire scaffold structure. So all of the black area is mineralized tissue in the pores, and the blue area here is where the, the bone is mineralizing towards the scaffold structures. The scaffold's starting to dissolve. Thank you, Chris. And... My favorite topic is histology, so I'm going to show you a little bit of, um, of how we can see that the kind of tissue that we're forming inside those scaffolds really is real tissue. Is it physiologically relevant? So this is taken from the inside of those scaffolds that we've used for two years in an implantation model, just to look at what kind of structures we're forming. And here we have a beautiful blood vessel, which is exactly what you need in order to feed the bone cells, to let them grow and proliferate, to flush away all the waste products and to bring in all the nutrients into the defect site. And you can see this beautiful pattern of osteocytes, which are mature bone cells that are orientating themselves around the blood vessels. And this is so that they can get the nutrients from the blood vessels to survive, to be able to create new bone and to be able to basically fill that scaffold with, with new structures. Um, this is an example of an SEM, scanning electron microscopy. You can see you've got this central blood vessel, and again, all of the, blood, all of the bone cells orientated around there. And this is just a schematic from any old textbook on bone that shows you that this osteon structure here has this central blood vessel and the orientation of the cells. So it's very important that we can demonstrate that we've actually got proper biologically functional bone within the scaffolds. And also, this is a fantastic example of what these mature bone cells look like within that scaffold. They're called osteocytes, as I described before, and they're, they're holding hands, they're talking to one another, they're communicating, they're telling each other, we're in the right environment here, let's mineralize, let's form new tissue, um, and I really love this picture, it's just a beautiful example of well, biology at its best. 
Moving on from a, quite a simple defect to here, which is a skull defect, which is not load-bearing, we've also done a lot of work at QUT, particularly Dietma Hutmacher, looking at healing tibial defects, so long bone defects. These are obviously under a lot of load. Here we can see we've 3D printed a cylindrical scaffold, which fits into a cylindrical defect that you can see here, so three centimeters. This is an x-ray of what that defect looks like, with a big gap here, which is where the scaffold gets implanted into. And this is just some of our results um, from a paper that was published quite recently. This column here shows what it looks like when you do not put any kind of intervention, any kind of scaffold, any kind of autograph, anything into that defect site. You don't get any bone healing. This group's a really important group to include in this study because we needed to demonstrate that if we do not intervene in this kind of injury, in this kind of segmental bone site, um, which many people suffer when they have sporting injuries, it simply won't heal. So we need to have a solution to this. This one here shows beautiful bridging all the way through. This is a, a CT scan, so this is the kind of scan you'll get in a hospital. This is a micro CT scan, so you get a little bit more detail on the, the mineral deposition. And this is histology. So you can see that the black area here is bone bridging all the way through the defect. Now, an autograft is a gold standard treatment in the clinic. You can see from this image here, it works really well. But has anyone had an autograft procedure before? Wow, no, okay. Well, what happens in an autograft, as the name implies, is a graft is taken from the same person. So if you go into hospital with a huge chunk of your leg missing, they will drill into your pelvis, they'll take a big chunk of bone out, and they'll implant it into your leg. So instead of going in with a limp on one leg, you come out limping on both legs because you've got a huge secondary operation site here. It works very well, it does heal the bone, but you can imagine that if your defect site in your leg is so large, you just cannot take enough bone from your pelvis to be able to implant back into that defect site. So this is what drives biofabrication. This is what drives the need to do 3D printed scaffolds because we can make scaffolds of really any shape or size and we can heal these defects um, based on the anatomy of the fractured bone and the autograft is just not sufficient when the defect sites are so large. Here we can see um, what it looks like when you've just implanted a scaffold by itself. You can see that the bone is not bridged. And then here is an example of one of our tissue engineering solutions, which is to use a scaffold, a bioactive scaffold, and to include a growth factor in there that stimulates new bone formation. So bone, bone morphogenic protein is um, clinically used. It's approved to be used in the clinic for spinal fusion and for long bone defects, for um, orbital floor um, surgery. And we know that it works very well, and the clinicians use this. Um, but they use it on like a little collagen sponge that isn't very strong. So we're developing technologies to be able to add it to much more mechanically robust scaffolds. We apply those to the scaffolds, we implant them, and this is the results that we're getting. So it's just as good as the autograph. So we've already developed a new tissue engineering solution for healing long bone defects. So how do we translate this hype, this research hype, into patient hope? Let's look for a moment at one of these Gantner hype cycles. Sorry, I'm planning the wrong way around. Um, if you look at the top of this here, you can see that 3D printing is a really exciting area at the moment. It's the top of the peak of expectations. Everybody's raving about it. But this isn't the most important or the most exciting part of this curve. If you look down here at these emerging technologies, these are much more exciting to us. And 3D printing has been identified. 3D bioprinting, biofabrication, has been identified as a, as a emerging technology. And this is accepted all over the world as a new and exciting emerging technology in additive manufacturing. So speaking about Australia in, generally, in general, how should we be positioning ourselves in the additive manufacturing arena? I have a couple of quotes here from a, a paper that was written by Morgan Stanley, um, and they really say that the improvements in printers and the growing portfolio of materials available are making this 3D additive manufacturing technology much, much more relevant, much more exciting. And also, it's very interesting con to consider that 40% of the patent applications in the additive manufacturing area are in the areas of biofabrication, so in the medical technology space. So these are very interesting facts. Australia has a really important role in traditional additive manufacturing industries, but perhaps it shouldn't be competing in established industrial markets, such as the car and the shipping and the aerospace industry, which are really sort of a little bit further behind countries such as Germany, such as China and India. But we really have an opportunity here to be able to revive the additive manufacturing industry in Australia through the creation of world-leading biofabrication niches. 
with substantial patient benefits and substantial manufacturing benefits. So how can we drive innovation and cost savings from a patient's point of view in, in, in biofabrication with medical technology? Well, the first things that benefits the patients are the diagnostics and the therapy choice. So we can use digital imaging and we can use 3D printing to give models to the physici physicians to assist them in actually diagnosing the issue, diagnosing the disease. So just taking you back to this example, which is a prime example of this, you've got your 3D models that the physician can actually handle. They can print them on the spot based on the, on the patient scan data. And we can also make scaffolds that we implant into the patient. So it's a twofold benefit. Also, the ability to make 3D custom patient-specific implants or even entirely new options such as new organs one day are also tremendous patient benefits. What about manufacturer benefits? So we have an opportunity with the biofabrication with medical technology to create low volume but very, very high value products. Also, one of the most interesting things that I've been um, hearing about recently is the reduced inventory. So when you consider that currently products are stored in warehouses, they're stored in, in the store cupboards and shops, we have the ability to make just-in-time solutions, on-the-spot solutions. So you're effectively taking an entire warehouse and you're condensing it into a 3D printer in your, in your office, in your business, wherever it is, and you're reducing the cost associated with having to store all these products that you have to then implant into the patient. So it's, it's really reducing that tremendously. You also reduce waste and you reduce assembly. Um, there's also that wonderful opportunity for incredible creativity with the design complexity. So you don't have to be medically associated to be designing these implants. You can be from the creative industries. You can be a, a dress designer. You can, you can really translate these skills into this amazing emerging market. And there's also an enormous amount of growth opportunities. So there's certainly an increased need for 3D printing and biofabrication skills in Australia and all over the world. And here's just a few examples of some current media, um, some papers and some current um, media. I'm not going to go through them too, too extensively, but you can see at the University of Wollongong, um, it's saying that Aussie experts are closer to making body parts. They're also 3D printing stem cells in Edinburgh, and they're making cartilage with hybrid printers, according to the BBC. So Australia really is home to very innovative technical universities. And we are really poised to be able to transform the additive manufacturing industry to deliver medical and economic success. And I just want to give you a really small example now of how QUT is moving forward in this area in order to launch an educational program. So it's underpinned by very strong education and research programs, and we're partnering with leading European universities. So this year, it will start next year, but this year we launched the world's first double master's program in biofabrication. And this is a partnership between the Queensland University of Technology and the University of Wollongong. And we're partnering with the University of Würzburg in Germany and the University Medical Center Utrecht in Holland. And this is how it's designed. So we have 10 students per year at QUT and 10 at the University of Wollongong. And they undertake a year of education and research in the area of biofabrication. And then in the second year, they will be sent to these European universities, and they'll have the second year of the research program there. And in return, we will receive students from Europe into our research programs over here. It's supported by the Commonwealth of Australia and also the EU, and it's a really wonderful opportunity. Okay, so thinking about the future of biofabrication and what we've just discussed here, I really want you to sort of shake this idea of um, this 3D printing hearts on the spot, because that's not really what we're about. We're about developing technologies, we're about sort of making incremental progress in terms of healing bone, healing cartilage, being able to create organ structures, put them into bioreactors, and then potentially implant those into patients. So I um, just want you to shake this idea from your mind at the moment. Um, so one thing that we're really focusing very hard at the moment is new design concepts. So we design our 3D printers as well as just utilizing the, the, um, the scaffolds that they produce. So here's just one example from um, our institute with regard to developing new technologies. So we've, we've built our own 3D printer. So we can afford sterility within the environment, humidity control, temperature control. We can print bioinks. We can add resolvable scaffolds into that um, process. And we have a wide range of engineers, programmers, um, physicists, mathematicians, all kinds of people working on this technology. And we're actually building these printers in-house now. And it's really, really exciting for us. And it's part of our huge passion over at EB. So final slide, the hospital of the future. So this is really looking to the future and what we're hoping will be achieved from biofabrication. 
So a patient will be admitted to hospital. Here's our example of the, the hospital of the future. They'll undergo a patient scan, as I described before, and we hope that every single hospital in the country will have a 3D printer there in the operating theatre. You'll be able to create customised, sterile, on-the-spot, anatomically precise scaffolds of any type of tissue, dependent on what kind of material you're printing with. And we can use those to heal bone, cartilage, muscle, blood vessel, multiple tissue types, and also ultimately organs. These will be implanted in situ, in the patient, in the operating theatre, and the patient will be able to come out of hospital hopefully much, much sooner and will not have a secondary side of, of surgery from an autograph, and this will be a cheap, cost-effective, on-the-spot solution. So I really hope that I've convinced some of you about biofabrication and its role in the future of regenerative medicine today, because we're very excited about the technology and we believe that it plays a, a, a pinnacle role in the additive manufacturing future for Australia. Um, I just very quickly want to put my most important slide up, which is my acknowledgement slide. So first of all, um, the funding from the ARC and the NHMRC, which is enabling this work to, to be um, ongoing, and also collaborators such as Dietmar Hutmacher and the Regenerative Medicine Group, Travis Klein and the Cartilage Regeneration Laboratory, and also the amazing Biomaterials and Tissue Morphology Group. And I particularly want to point out Sean, who's really been... He's here today, and he's getting embarrassed. He's really helped me put together some of these wonderful animations for this slideshow. So it's very important that you have strong teams. It's very important that you acknowledge the participation of these strong teams. And last of all, I just really want to thank um, Ian for giving me the opportunity to come today to talk about this biofabrication and the technology and, and the future. So thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening.